Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I spoke to David this morning. He said everybody should come. That this guy is hilarious. Yeah. He's supposed to be incredible. Yeah. 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 I've, 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 I've never heard him be here. I'm very excited. So it's 7 30. 7 30 tonight. So that's so those are a couple of things coming up. And then you know, check your emails because we have more. a Holocaust program. That's the big one. Do you, do you want to speak about it a little sure. bit? Okay. Doris here? No, Doris is not here. Um, so we have an amazing opportunity on April 9th, um, an exclusive tour at the Holocaust Museum for Time Center people, friends, family, invite everyone, all ages. Not only is it such a great, great opportunity because it's us in our community, but we're going to be led by two, maybe even three docents that are part of our community. So we're going to go for a tour. It starts at one o'clock and the tour is going to go for about an hour and a half with the trained docents. And then here's where I get goosebumps. We're going to have an exclusive survivor speak oh, for our group afterwards. So that's why I invite your kids. I mean, it's so important. So it's April 9th at one o'clock. Um, there is a charge for it because there's admission to the um, to the museum as well as like a, a honorarium for the speaker. So it's twenty five dollars a person. It was in yesterday's email. It's on the website. It'll be in emails to come. So I just think that this could be a, a in some cases a once in a lifetime opportunity for some people to hear firsthand from a survivor. So mark your calendars. We'd love to have a full house. Space will be limited. I mean, we will eventually have to cut it off, but so sign up to April 9th. Yeah, that we, we put it up yesterday. So it's, it's on the email. email and it'll, and, and it I'm going to send an email just about that in the next day or two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just very distracted by your haircut. It's so cute. Okay. I'll carry on. <laughs> I'd be looking at you the whole time being like, I need to tell her. Okay, fine. We're going to get started. So many of you were here last week and, and some of you were not, but we're going to be finishing up the, I'm oh, sorry, two weeks ago, because yeah. last week was per. So two weeks ago when maybe half the room or, you know, different people come every week. So it's hard to sometimes not finish the topic, but I felt like at the end of the class, which was on judgment, we were really, really rushing and trying to stick in a lot of things. And Paula had some great insight. And I, I think we're going to just carry it on, even though I know Marnie's like, Marnie's my best student who's like, what are we learning? What chapter? I want to be sure that I read the chapter. So I did tell you it's chapter two. So we're going to do chapter two just for you. Just for you. We're going to be Sure. So I was not that student. <laughs> so so we're gonna do that, but I just want to wrap up. Okay. So just we're gonna just try to finish up because it's such and there's so much that we could really talk about how this affects our our lives, our relationships. It affects everything where our mind is. Right. If we're if we are judgy and judging people all the time, chances are we're the ones that are suffering the most. Right, like we're the ones that are. Remember, we took with that suitcase. Like we're schlepping along a, a lot of luggage with us of judgment, and it's really not our place. It doesn't help us. So we want to let go of that. So I'm gonna start with one of my favorite stories, and this is I'll tie this in. You know, Passover is coming, so it's a pre-Passover, a little bit of inspiration, and then I'm gonna ask you guys to listen to the story and hear it out because I'm gonna paint the picture. In, in the way that I like to paint a picture, okay? And then I want to, I want to hear some other ways that we could look at a story and um, possibly, you know, critique it or, or, or be like, or roll your eyes at it, okay? So, so going into the story, just know like Eve Levy is gonna share one of her favorite stories. So, so you know that it's gonna be like, wow. But I want you to also, I want you to like listen to closer, okay? So, okay. Okay, so this is the story. Okay, it's been a long time. Okay, so the story takes place in the 1800s in a small town in Verdichev. Has anyone heard of Verdichev? Small town in Russia, Ukraine. I'm not sure exactly where it fell, what where the borders were when the story happened. There was a very famous rabbi. His name was Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Miberdichev. And that's how he was known. There are there are dozens and dozens of stories. If you Google him, you'll get many stories. So the reason that I'm sharing this story is because in the book that we're learning, the Soul Construction by Ruffy Kovel, 
she uses one of his stories as an example. And I didn't love the story. And, and, but, but I'm like, I'm gonna give you the story that I love. But it's interesting how we could pick and choose from stories what we hear and what perspective we want to take. So this is the story. It was Seder night. All the work was done, house is clean, table is set. Rabbi Levi Yitzhaki sits down at the head of his table. All his children, his family, his wife, everyone comes, they're sitting. All his students start filling the house. He's ready, his eyes are closed. He's ready to start, everything is ready. You could just picture it. All that work that went in before, we're ready to start. And he says, I am not gonna start this Seder until three things are brought to me. The students come close, sure Rabbi, what is it? What can we get you? Persian silk scarves, Turkish tobacco, and a piece of bread. You know, there was the guest in the room. Everyone is like, did he, is he losing his marbles? Like what's going on? I mean, Turkish sil silk scarves and Persian tobacco or, or the opposite, okay, the opposite. <laughs> Sorry. Bread. It was, it was punishable by death to bring, to smuggle things in from across borders at that time. So to bring, to bring in that Turkish tobacco and the Persian silk scarves, I mean, like someone would have to be risking a lot. And a piece of bread in this small Jewish little town in the 1800s in town of Berdichev, like a very observant town. I mean, how is that possible? He says, no, nope, I'm not gonna start the Seder until you bring me these three things. So the students like look at each other. I mean, they oh, okay, fine. So they all file out and one hour passes and two hours pass and three hours pass. And the students are finally coming and congregating like by the door of the house. Did you get that? And they have a small pile of, of the silk scarves and a larger pile of the tobacco. And they have, you know, we just couldn't find any comments. They come into the Rebbe, he says, what do you have for me? And he, they show what they found. He said, but there's not a speck of chametz to be found in the city. And then the rabbi raises up his hands to heaven and he says, God, they put, they put guards on all the borders. They put police officers. At, you could be punished. You could be fined if you would do anything <laughs> that's illegal. But all it says in the Torah are two verses, Bali Ra'e, that you shouldn't see it, Bali Matze, and you shouldn't find it, Chametz. You shouldn't have Chametz in your midst. Four words in the Torah, and look at your, look at your children. Like not a, not a crumb of Chametz could be found in the city. There's no guards, no one's watching over, no one's telling us, like, you could do what you want. But those few verses in the Torah that say, this is what we do, and that's enough. And so his arms are raised up and he says, which means who are like your people of Israel. And he flops the table and he says, now we can start our Seder. Hmm. So I always love this. I, I love this story. I'm not sure why. It just, I'm not sure why. There was something about it like that. I think the Jewish people are very special. So I see that he, he wanted God to see that. Like he wanted to prove a point, maybe for all the people there, maybe for you know, that the hundreds of years that the story was going to be shared again and again to remind us what's really, really important to us. So everything that we're doing is because there's a, you know, there's a, you know, it's, it's not just like a dusty old book from thousands of years ago. It actually, it actually carries a lot of weight and we hold whatever we can until today. So let's take a step back from this story. Okay. How are you guys feeling about the story? Did anyone like it? Am I the only one that liked it? So well, I, I liked it in the sense that, I mean, why was he even sending them out to go find bread? You know, it's Passover. You shouldn't find it. So they didn't find clearly it. Clearly, so he's trying to prove a point. Right. And the point was proven because they didn't find it. So right. that's, it's, okay. it's almost so, like a miracle happened, you know, kind of. Thank God sense. that they didn't find it. Right. Yeah. Thank, right. Yeah. Because okay. Okay. It could have been. What else? What, what do you guys, Marnie, what do you, sure. what do you, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go back to There's a test. Sent to him and saying, "Did you do a good enough job?" Okay, okay. Meaning, did we did do, try? Is, do you think that was his intention? He wasn't trying to catch the Jewish people messing up. That's for sure. 
No, he's saying, did you try as hard as anyone could possibly to fulfill events? So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't even think of it from that. I think he knew that he wasn't going to find the Chavez and he wanted to prove the point that, that uh -huh. we're willing to go such a far away just because God gives us commandments to do. I don't know. But but I, I like that other perspective. Anyone else? What do you, uh, Wendy? What do, I'm still digesting. Okay. I'm still thinking. Right? So so the thing with these stories, like Rabbi Yitzchak Miberdichev, right? His stories all have the same, they're different details, but they all have the same spin. And the story that I read today in the book was, was a, a story of um, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak is traveling in a wagon with some of his students. And he sees on the side of the road, there was a wagon that was broken, the wheel had come off or something. And there were, you know, the man from the wagon was fixing it. And the man was dressed in his Jewish, Binary or whatever, I can't imagine. Like maybe he's wearing his talit, right? Yeah. His prayer shawl. Yeah, he was wearing his prayer shawl. His tefillin. He had. He was literally in the middle of his morning prayers, or just finished it, and he so he's dressed in his holy attire, and he's in the mud, fixing the wheel. So his students looked at that and said, "What a disgrace! Like that's not respectful." Like, take off your tefillin, take off your talit, and put it, fold it up nicely. Why should it be dragged in the mud? The students were aghast with, with judgment, that it was not a good decision. And Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, what does he say, Sue? Um, Master of the universe, look at your people. They are so attached to you that even when they are fixing their wagon wheel, they simply can't bear to take off your holy gun. Okay. So, so what's happening? Because it's really, as I said, there's, there, look it up online, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Mibradichev. There's so many stories and they all have the same perspective. He keeps on, he's almost like this voice for the Jewish people saying, look at your children. They're really, really good. Maybe he's even protected. Maybe he also might've seen something that, I don't know, maybe he should have taken off his talit before getting down in the mud. Who knows? But he is choosing to err on the side of, or, or, or generous judgment, um, what it's called over here is favorable judgment, All right? Yeah, what do you say? I think he's teaching his, his students not to be judgmental. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, even if you see in yourself that something is wrong, you say to the kids, there's another side to the story. Right. But is this the same rabbi that is buried in Ukraine? No, that's that everybody no. Knows, no. Uman, no, that's that's Uman. Rabbi Nachman Mibraslov. He has a different a different theme to his stories. It's all like it's there's no despair. It's all good. Be happy. Like that's Rabbi Nachman Mibraslov. And this rabbi, his whole thing was like, look at your look at the Jewish people. We're so great. Now, are we all so great? No. But he is always fighting, and it's almost like this right, reverse psychology, when you keep telling a child, or you keep saying, but it's so good, or it's going to be okay, or whatever it is, we're like talking to ourselves. I think that was actually what he was doing all his years of his life. Every story, the side he took was always seeing the positive, seeing the potential, see maybe even being creative in his mind to make up a story that could possibly be the, the, you know, the possible outcome, but maybe not the probable outcome, right? That's what he did. So this week I had a conversation. I was with a friend and we met someone new and we were meeting someone for the first time. So when you meet someone, I mean, what happens? Judgment, right? Which is kind of a good thing, right? Judgment, the Torah does not tell us do not judge. It just says judge favorably or judge with, kindness or give the benefit of the doubt like there's different ways of, of saying about it right but we don't say don't judge because judgment is there to protect us right it is a mechanism that we need to use we need judgment to make good choices so a friend and I we meet a new person and we get into this rip-roaring conversation so but we're in judgment mode right because that's just normal we're seeing do we is she a safe person do we want to be friends with her whatever it is and she used some words that seemed very, very harsh. 
And it was almost like, okay, not for us. You know, that type of, which, which, right? And, and that's how my friends heard the words. Now I heard the words in a completely different way. So the words, like she, she was talking about, I don't know, just, you know, standing up for what's right. And, and you know, something that I value, like just like you see something, say something, right? But my friend heard it as, as possibly like a really strong reaction. Right, like me, like that's just we don't do that. We don't like some people don't like any confrontation, right? But on the other side, I said, but but how amazing is it that you could get over whatever fear you have and stand up to an injustice that you see? So my friend said, you know, Eve, I'm so happy you shared that with me because in my mind, I, she had kind of felt like, you know, just just not not the right, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah just like it didn't work for her. So it's very interesting how the same conversation could be heard in very different ways. So how do we train our mind to kind of see or, or be open to, to something else, something more than us, more than what we're, our small capacity? Okay, so last week we went through three different ways, right, from this book. There was a beginning, intermediary, and advanced way of judgment, okay? So the first one was, um, is, the, the verse in the Torah that says that you should judge with righteousness. That's how we should judge. With righteousness, which is giving the benefit of the doubt and curiosity. And we spoke about all that last week. The second level was blessing God for the bad or the seemingly bad as he blesses for the good. So that's like a higher level. It's kind of seeing the other side. Like, Maybe it seems bad. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe there's more to it. And then the third level is blessed is man for he was created in the image of God. Okay. And I think we kind of stop there. And I want to just pick up one or two more points. And Paula, I want you to air what you, what you shared with me at the end of the class. So seeing man created in the image of God. So I, we have some oranges in the back over there. So uh, you could think of a fruit, okay? Think of, I was thinking of a kiwi, right? Cause a kiwi, like when you look at it in the store, it's kind of ugly, but when you peel it, it's like a beautiful vibrant color and sweet. And, but who wants to eat the peel? I mean, some people do eat the peel possibly. I don't know, like fuzzy and furry. <laughs> but I don't like, yeah, she eats the peel. Okay, I, I know some people do, but, but just think of, so any peel, whatever your fruit of choice is, a, a, a fruit that you peel, right? The peel is just the protection, okay? Once you peel away what we call in Hebrew, the klipa, klipa is the outer layer. Then you could get in to actually see what's happening. When we meet someone and we just have a quick conversation, right away, our first initial judgment and reaction is just based on the peel. It's not, we don't know this person. We don't know where they're coming from. We don't know where they're going. We don't know what they've been through. We don't know any of that. We cannot judge someone until we've been in their shoes. So that'll never happen because you can never stand in someone's shoes, right? So how do we heal a way to see what's deeper inside? That's the question. How do we get rid of that kipa? How do we use our eyes to penetrate into someone beyond the facade? beyond what's at face value. We want to be elevated people. We want to be able to say, to, to be like Rabbi, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak. And by the way, in his point and period of history, there were a lot of ups and downs with the Jewish people. It, it wasn't like a, a, you know, he was doing what he was doing and giving all that positivity and encouragement because we needed it. Mm -hmm. So how do we see a situation in front of us, peel away the hard exterior, and look at the soul or the heart of what's happening. You have to have patience and time to, like, I'm just thinking of getting to know somebody. And I, I know that in the past, we've gotten to know people really quickly and do things with them. And, you know, like, really like a fast, furious relationship. And then you really get to know them. Yeah, <laughs> Something like that. Right. But I think you have to have the time, you know, to get to know somebody. Okay. Yeah. 
So, so, so I, I totally agree with you, right? And that's a quality long-term relationship. But what I'm trying to ask or figure out is how do we even have an initial meeting and see beyond? Like, is it possible? Is it possible for our eyes to be trained to look into the heart of a person and not get stuck on any externals? I think it's your background experiences because there's some people you are just going to vibe with and have a little love fest from the beginning, mm -hmm. even as a girlfriend. And there's other people that you don't see what they see. So it's, it's what you're bringing to the table that makes you gel together. Okay, Julie, can I, can I pick on you? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. Julie, Julie and I, I, I love Julie, <laughs> like so, so much. <laughs> But head it out there, I know. Yeah, no, I totally judged you. You did. Yeah. Like I and, and it's I can only say this now because I learned from it that you really cannot judge a book by its cover. Because when I met Julie and she was like, oh, I can't come to your classes, like I'm Allie's, like in other words, I mean, you didn't say those words, but you basically said those words. Like I've been learning with Allie for years and like everything she said was like amazing, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm never, I'm never gonna feel connected. So, so imagine, imagine, imagine if I didn't get over my own insecurity. Okay. Sure. It was a conversation whether you were going to come on that trip. <laughs> to be honest, it all turned out fine, so we could talk about it now. But I wasn't sure. I'm like, is will she be open to me? It's hard to step into someone's shoes, and like you had your thing going on, yeah. And so there was judgment. So so I had to dig deep. Okay, and this is I'm gonna I'm gonna share what I think it boils down to. When we pass judgment and we get stuck, we have to look ourselves in the mirror. This was my issue. It had nothing to do with you. I felt insecure. It always, it, it really boils down to that. When we can't get past making an initial judgment that could be positive, chances are we are feeling insecure about something. There's something that we're not complete about in our own lives. And we need to do the work. It, it truly doesn't have much to do with why are we putting judgment on another person? Right? Answer, answer. Right? What was yeah. your biggest cheerleader, right? Yeah. Biggest <laughs> cheerleader. Like I've taken her on two trips since then. I won't go anywhere without Julie. <laughs> I was just going to say something you talked about so beautifully on our Israeli women's trip when we were back a couple of weeks ago is how often I think, and especially in this area, we get stuck on the materialistic look right. of someone without really seeing what's in their soul and who they are. And I think that's kind of what you, I forgot the Hebrew term that you talked about. You did a school. The like the, 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 the garments. Oh, you talked about that a few weeks ago. And, and um, I think it's true. Sometimes that stops us from like getting to know someone. Oh, you're saying like the baguette. Yes, the baguette or the clothing yes, the, is a the, baguette. It's a traitor. It yes, betrays who you really That's what are. we talked about. Right. And without it. getting to really like seeing high school and soul yeah. and know who they are. And right. It's just made me think of yeah, that. so, so true. That's, that's usually where we, I don't know, we get stuck right. over there and it's so superficial. Like it has nothing to do with who the person is. I was going to say, I have a unique experience. <laughs> I continue to learn things about myself and I'm certainly past a certain age. I moved into a retirement, um, self-sufficient retirement home and we have people coming in First of all, they're harassed by the move. So your first impression of them is never the correct one. And then some of them have had their be have had better days, but you can't ignore them because as you get to talk to them, you realize they did have a life, they had children, they did accomplish things, but they are not all who they were. And I see that I'm not all who I was, whatever I was. And so I don't, I don't really take it as being judgmental in one sense, because we're all at a different phase. We're not really, even the most glamorous and most intelligent, we are not who we are, 80s and the 90s. And um, 
it's a new experience for me. Mm -hmm. You know, how much time would you invest? You want to be friendly to meet all men with a cheerful smile or whatever the saying was. And yet there are people that you will meet them with a cheerful smile, but you will not mm -hmm. after a certain, you know, so right. you, you feel bad. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I'm, so what, say, I'm hearing, I'm still what I'm hearing you say is like, there's like, like life has kind of humbled you enough to see just the, there's, and yeah. that comes with maturity. Well, it comes with maturity and it comes with a sense of guilt. You know, I don't know how others perceive me, <laughs> but, you know, people are generally very nice. Of course, there are a few outstanding ones who are not so nice and everybody knows that. Right? <laughs> but those that are nice, but they're not who they were. Right. And so I don't know. I'm, right. As I say, I'm learning. I don't. Right. We're all learning. And because these are your neighbors, these are right. your family. Yeah. yeah. You have to, you have to make it work. You have to right? make it work. So that's also, so there's, so there's a couple things I'm hearing. One is like, this is the situation. Like, yeah, it's like you, you could judge, but that's going to hurt you. You, you, or you could welcome and be curious and also have a lot of empathy from your life experiences, just knowing that everyone's coming in in difficult situations. But I only want to spend so much time. Right, right. And that's that also a, a good, like your judgment is giving you a choice. Yeah. Like and, where you're gonna. And with a guilt. Yeah, wow, so, okay. okay, beautiful, okay. Can you say something? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just about how you're judged, at least over here in this corner. Yeah. Oh. You love you. Inside and out, what you just shared. Was well, they so don't know. But, <laughs> but I do. And but she knows me. So okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very love. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. But it, yeah, it's, it's, so, yeah. Okay. So, so I agree that um, when you're judging, it's, it's from your inside, like something you see in yourself. And I was thinking of an example, like, when you go like to the grocery store and some person in line says something really nasty to you, like, oh, it's the ugliest sweater you've had or whatever, <laughs> you're like, oh, they must have had a bad day. Right. Or, that, that's or a really good, that's a, a great way to respond. But, but Not your, the second one. <laughs> but if your husband says it to you, it's like it's really hurtful because you're oh. like invested <laughs> right. in that person. So you like yeah, you could yeah. brush off. Mm -hmm. Like I remember, is is there an expression like make yourself like a duck and let it slide? Is that an expression? Like let things slide, let it roll off of you. Like yeah, yeah. But it's hard to do that with the people that are in your inner circle because it really hurts. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. very true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. 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 You only have so much time and energy and effort. So how do you discriminate what is the best way to spend your time if there is no judgment? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Years ago, I found myself- Ricky, just speak up as much for- okay. Years ago, I found myself like being really Draw, like pulled down into a very negative state of mind, especially when it came to other people. And I would be very quick to judge and judge negatively. And, and I didn't like that about myself. And I really wanted to change that about myself. And the Hebrew phrase that means to judge others favorably is to be done the cops of food. And I decided to play the Domikovsk hood game with myself. <laughs> and when the stakes are high, when you have someone close to you, when you have someone that you're meeting for the first time that is potentially you have a relationship that could go south, the, the stakes are really high and there's a lot of pressure and it, it's hard to take the time to just judge you know, people favorably and it's like too close to home. So I would take situations that had nothing to do with me where I'd be walking around, I'd be in the grocery store and like I see something and want to judge it harshly, but it really had nothing to do with me. And in my mind, I would play this game and I would think, what could possibly be going on in this person's life that would justify what just happened? That would not just justify it, but possibly turn it into a good thing. You know, like, like you were saying, like you could either see it as fine, that's for her, but, or you can see it as, this is a really positive trait in her 
it's just coming out in a way that's, you know, that I don't need to necessarily engage with that. But I found that the more I played that game with myself, it didn't really affect anyone else except for me. I became a softer person. I became an easier going person. I became a more open person and a less judgmental person. And even though it took time from me, it it gave time back to me because it, it improved me. Love it. So it, it was actually like a like a good way for me to spend my time, even though it seemed like and the more you try it, the easier it Fine, we're all going to be playing this game. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if anyone doesn't know, I just want to introduce Rifki, because for some of you, you might not know Rifki. So Rifki was, um, she's my co-leader on the trips, wow. and she is one of our, our newest recruits to our leadership team. So that's Rifki. She lives in West Rogers. Thank you for sharing that. It's really practical. Um, I, you've been raising your hand. Can you, I was in, I was thinking of something. Your story reminds me, but I work at a school and I have a board where I put like a quote of the week. And one week, my quote said, "The greatest gift you could give anybody is the benefit of the doubt." Mm -hmm. And one of my colleagues came in and she said, "That's really the greatest gift you can give yourself." Mm -hmm. And I agree that like it it is because instead of walking around feeling angry or disliking mm -hmm. someone or something, like you just walk around feeling like that person's not as bad as maybe yeah. it seems like they are. And just viewing people with, with that kind of mindset, it helps them, but it really- it, It's all, it's, this is, it's all people. inner work. Like yeah. if we could nip this in the bud, like we will be yeah. such a more expanded yeah. version of ourselves, 100%. Yeah. I was gonna say, it's a lot of self-talk. Like yeah. you have to continue mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. keep, like keep asking, so why am I saying that? Why am I thinking mm -hmm. that? Like, right. it's a lot of mm -hmm. internal work. Right. Right. And if you- Why am I triggered by right. that? Right. And then if you look at that, a lot of times it just really helps you. Like, it just feels so much better to know, oh, that's why. And this is what this, this is why I'm, it's not me that they're feeling uncomfortable with, it's me that's feeling, you know, so I think it's just lots of self-talk. Okay, let's have one more comment and then I want to, because I want to carry on to the next. So what I want to say is that we're all judgmental. We're all judgmental. So Rifki was able to teach herself how to overcome it. And I have to say that ever since that I've been coming here and we talk about this because we cannot always, me, cannot figure out all by myself. But once you start talking about it, and I did the same thing. And the other day there was a conversation and I said, well, maybe there was a reason I thought, damn, I'm feeling better about that. <laughs> wow, this sober thing is working. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. she's, why did she do that? What? Mm. So thank you, everyone. So that's amazing. Like, you learn, you're open. That's yeah. all about learning. And there's one thing somebody told me. There's an old Jewish saying, which says, "You learn all your life, and you still die dumb." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> scenario and then we're going to move on to the next topic but but <laughs> the words that that go that I trained myself to think and I've shared this with you guys before when I see something that right away I start judging like that's not okay so do you guys remember what I told you the words that I always tell myself is it must be so hard to be that. Yes. And it works every time. Like I do this with my kids, Ooh. with my teens, with my spouse, with yeah. anyone that I see. Someone like someone doesn't put the cart back at a grocery store. I've trained myself to just say those words. And it all of a sudden, like I just feel a little bit more compassion. Okay. So we're I just gonna put one more scenario. Jagail, I don't want I don't want to miss anyone's wisdom here. My mom works at the customer service department. Oh. <laughs> he started um, very upset, out of disproportionately upset people coming in and screaming at her. Oh, and so. you, you play to get to her, and I think it's not about the return, right? There's something else going on. In the, the emotion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hey. Wow. Hey. So smart. Just saying to them, give them a hug. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but no, but the, I love that. I love that. That's so beautiful. But so true. Other, 
it's not usually the problem or the issue. It's what's going on behind it. So, so I'm going to just give you guys one one scenario. Um, and this was this was kind of this this idea came to my head. I was uh, I was communicating with Paula this morning, and she was talking about judgment that exists even within a family. Like, oh, you're too this. Oh, you're too that. If anyone is different to us, if anyone thinks different, acts different, is different, there's we could go into a place of fear because, because what it might do is it might, it might make you ask yourself or look yourself in the mirror and say, if they're doing something so differently, are they right? Does, am I off? Like that's the fear, right? The fear is, that's the insecurity, right? So the, the situation that came to my mind was when I was a child, my parents and my siblings and our little dog, Matek, we, we became observant Jews. We went down this path. We had no idea what, what was going to happen. I mean, we literally took one little teeny baby step, but the uproar of the rest of the family is something that I don't know if I will ever be able to process because I was just a kid, a teenager. I, we're just doing our thing, family simchas. We would schlep out to wherever it was and show up and eat our airplane kosher meal in the corner of the, you know, the golf course and what, whatever, like dance the hora. And even though like at that point we, we were trying not to mix dance, like we were right in there for that one hora. And, you know, the, the, the simplas that would start on a Saturday, like I remember counting the minutes with my whole family until Shabbat came out, like the exact minute and we would make Havdalah and we would fly to the simcha. And we put so much effort. I mean, this is like my whole childhood was this basically. But when we would get to the hall, no matter how much effort we we put, it was always met with like, you guys are so late, so disrespectful. And it's it's just crazy how like if they knew how we put everything, we just didn't want to put our value. Like our value at that point was observing the Sabbath. We didn't impose it on anyone, but I think it brought a lot of insecurity to some of the people like the people now that I'm older and understanding what was going on because I never understood it like how can my aunt be so awful to me like because how is it understand. well they I think it, it really brought up it was it's it wasn't me right that's right. what I'm thinking like that's like it, well, it, it, it's, it's lack of education. No, I it's think lack of knowledge. I think they, it's, it's also built. It, there's it, well, it, there's yeah. whatever it is. It's all the emotions that lead to the person that's passing the judgment right. being or feeling a little bit insecure. Ooh, totally. Okay? This is when we talk about unity. Unity is like my favorite conversation to ever have with another Jew. Like I love Jews. Like I literally will like find a Jew in the middle of a foreign country and like hug them in the street because I was just, yeah, right. just like, or the airplane or, or the right? store, but everywhere, or the everywhere, everywhere. Oh, I promise you, I have, <laughs> at the bookstore, I picked her up over there. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I promise that <laughs> you like being called like that I picked you up. I totally <laughs> picked you up. <laughs> Yes. But yes, lots of okay. so, so so here's here's what I see. What I see the problem because I think unity is the the root that could heal a lot of the problems that we have within the Jewish people. But like I'm I'm like on a soapbox, like screaming it to the world, like unity, it's unity, like unity is gonna make everything better, guys. And no one is like no one is like jumping on, jumping on it, you know. So but I but I see the reason now. It's all these reasons that we judge people it comes from our own place of fear and insecurity. That's also what's happening in the Jewish world. If you're different to me, then how can we be friends? Because you might, like, maybe I'm feeling a bit of a hole. Maybe I'm feeling a little insecure in my own place. And, and I'm too scared to, to venture into anything else because I'm too shaky. That's what happened in my childhood with our family. I mean, it's a very fractured family at this point, even though there's nothing we wouldn't do for our family. It wasn't, it wasn't us. It was, it was them. And that's what Paula brought up at the end of last week. She was talking about the judgment that we put on each other. Like it's, it's usually like one-sided. We think it's one-sided that the judgment is flowing in one direction, but it's usually reciprocal. Like there are two sides. 
So I, I'm going to move on to the next topic now, if that's okay. But I just wanted to, yeah, with our 10 minutes left, we're going to move on to forgiveness, okay? Which you actually said the greatest quote. You you shared you shared about not judging is really the greatest gift you give yourself. And it's the same thing with forgiveness. Forgiveness is, it's first of all, it's a state of mind. It, it affords mental freedom. And if you could forgive, then you could also move on. Like you could, it, it's a gift. It truly is a gift. So, so um, the example that the chapter starts on, and if you have the book, I'm, I'm starting at page 28. Um, the example is from this past week's Torah portion. It's the example of the sin of the golden calf. So we all know the story, right? The Jewish people came out of seeing miracles with their own eyes, splitting sea, the, the plagues, the everything. God literally walked them on dry land through the sea. 40 days later, they're standing at Mount Sinai. They received the Torah. And all they need to do is wait for Moses to come down with the tablets but they miscalculated, they were off in their calculation by one day and they gave everything up. They literally went back to their old mentality and before they know it, dancing and singing around this, this golden calf, all of their faith slipped away, right? And Moses comes down, he sees this in his fury and in his despair, he shatters the tablets. Now, what happens next in this storyline? Because this is really where the root of forgiveness is. God wants to wipe out the Jewish people. I mean, this is the example that I gave. We taught this Torah portion on Shabbat. The example was, imagine how vulgar it would be for a bride and groom to go off to their honeymoon. And on the honeymoon, the guy is messing around with the waitress. Like, right, you, it's mind boggling. Like you can't stay loyal for a honeymoon. Like. Get yourself together, like keep your, keep your stuff together. Like it's just, it's, it's, it's unfathomable, but that's what we did. We were disloyal to God in the moment of such intensity and commitment. It was, it was like a chuppah over our head. We married God, so to speak. We committed to him. We committed to being the Jewish people, the chosen nation, whatever, whatever we want to describe it as. And we messed up so bad. So God wants to destroy us. And Moses is the one that stands up for the Jewish people. And he actually says, if you're going to wipe them out, take me with them. Erase me from your book. I don't even want my name in your book, right? Like, I don't even want to be a part of, of this great story of, of your creation and the whole Torah. If you're getting rid of them, get rid of me. And basically, for it was a duration of um, was it about 40 days? It was a couple weeks. Okay. For weeks, Moses begs God to forgive his flock. And okay, so, so it's, it's a couple weeks. It's three months, actually. So three months carry on of Moses begging God to forgive the Jewish people. And then the day of forgiveness was the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And five days later, or four days later, right after Yom Kippur, we have Sukkot, which is the holiday that represents God's embrace. So God kind of protects the Jewish people in his, in his protective embrace. So this is really, this is like such a, a fundamental story of our people and just of people. And we see that forgiveness is really etched into the, the very fabric of the universe like this is you see this like and it's all written out like the, the conversation Moses asking and pleading and saying God like you know you're a God you should you should be able to forget we're supposed to emulate God in this world so all of this talk about forgiveness is really talking to us God forgives everyone for the most that every sin can be forgiven believe it or not right even on someone's deathbed right with your last words you could completely atone. And teshuva, repentance, is something that is so widely spoken about and used and in Judaism, right? We have a whole system for, for coming back, for saying I'm sorry. So this is something that is very, very core to everything. Okay, and what it is and what it is not, okay? And we're gonna try to be practical for the last five, 10 minutes. 
Okay. So what is what is an apology? So so God always gives me fresh content. So this morning was uh, one of those mornings. <laughs> so it was like the worst morning. Like it, I, I literally was like screaming so much at my kid to get into the car. And like literally my neighbor, I have to go and apologize to the neighbor. <laughs> like Stephanie, Stephanie, she was literally like, okay. No, it was bad. It was bad. It's not usually that bad. But I was so frustrated because, <laughs> no, okay. Like, I don't know what they heard. I don't know, but I, I was, okay. <laughs> anyway, so what happened was, so, so this is last night was the punishment for the youngest child because he made everyone leave. And basically, it's day after day so last night I'm like I you know it was not a shining moment for me I'm like you will be in bed by 7 p.m tomorrow you know I threatened and then I went out to women wine and wisdom and came home at 10 o'clock at night and he's still up like total flop, total flop. but um tonight is another another chance but what happened was I I in the car I was trying to calm myself down it took me till about I got to two weeks like in the West Rockers, so I was able to breathe properly but all I said was you need to say I'm sorry because he basically made everyone leave. And that's the theme that's happening. Like just because he's not interested in getting there on time, his siblings need to suffer. And we have like a 45 minute commute every morning. So, and we were, everyone was upset. Like there was such a, it was so upsetting and he couldn't care less. Like, I, I even said that Sue. I'm like, I'm just gonna love him in the driveway. Not in the driveway. I said something worse. <laughs> Right it was probably the worst morning. <laughs> but it now. <laughs> anyway, so, so this is the crazy thing. I was so desperate for him to say, I'm sorry. So of course he didn't want it, right? He wouldn't say the words. And then finally I said, You are not getting out of this car. And I'm thinking, like, I have to go home. I need to go teach. Like, like I'm punishing myself basically. I'm like, you will not get out of this car until I hear those words. So once like he saw, like, okay, she means business. He was like, he said it, but no one could hear it, right? It's like this whole back and forth. The whole ride was a disaster. So finally, finally, he whispers it till I'm like, Tahila, did you hear it? Did you hear it? And she's like, what so, But it meant nothing. It meant nothing. Because he doesn't, you know why? Because he doesn't think he did anything wrong. In his mind, in his nine-year-old mind, he said, I'm mad at the world that they had to change the clocks this week. Oh, wow. <laughs> In his mind, he did nothing wrong. He just needed his sleep. So he's, he's like, I'm not saying I'm sorry for what? So very often when we try to apologize or try to get to a place of forgiveness, it comes with the word, but, or if, if I upset you, even that if gives like, well, I'm not sure if I actually did or didn't. It doesn't mean we're, we're not owning anything. So very often, listen to the words that are coming out of your mouth. If you're really genuinely asking and owning up to something, it, there's no buts or ifs, and it's not lip service, okay? Because what, what forgiveness really is, it's not, it's not an apology, right? It's not, um, let me just, yeah. This is a lot of, there's a lot of beauty over here. According to Jewish guidelines, a proper apology is this. I am sorry that X, Y, Z, right? You fill in whatever you did wrong. It's so simple, right? I am sorry that Judaism offers a user-friendly formula to, for repentance. And one of the most important ingredients is a verbal admission of guilt. And if you can't articulate verbally what you did wrong, you do not deserve anyone's forgiveness. How can you regret something if you didn't even realize you did it? Be careful not to dilute your remorse with excuses, nor to com compromise it with, count with count counter reacts, okay? So once you come up with whatever you wanna say that you know, you're, you're basically your verbal articulation, right? At the end of that, you pause and you say, do you forgive me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the formula, okay? And obviously there's, there's more that we should put into this formula because the timing needs to be op optimal. And you, know, you, you have to make sure that you're in the right space and maybe you want someone to be there. Maybe you don't want someone else to be there. Like you just have to make sure, like use your seichel, uh, your smarts and 
Okay, so what if someone does not forgive? So what, what, according to Judaism, what happens if you go and you ask, right? Could you forgive me? You've done it in a genuine way as best as you can. Yes, so, so yeah, so, so two more tries to try to appease or soften the other person and convince them that you have changed, right? You have to convince them of that. And, and this is the best line in this chapter because it's so, so important to realize this. Often the day of apology is not the day of forgiveness. In our microwave generation, we expect quick, quick change. So I'm gonna share a story and I'm so happy you came by the way. And I knew you had to leave early, but I'm so happy you came. It's been such a long time, please come back. Take care. Okay, so here's my story. Some of you might've heard the story. I made a short video, I think for one of, one of my groups. So, um, Two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when I, I went to, I flew into Atlanta for one day to walk my friend down the aisle. And it was so magical. And I was so excited because I'm going in for a wedding, right? I thought I'm going in for a wedding. But the city I was going to, Atlanta, I can't even say Atlanta without feeling a stomach ache because I had a very hard fracture with a friend that lives in Atlanta. And this is Before years ago. Yeah. This is years ago, pre-COVID. Yeah. And I don't have fractures in, I, I literally could count on one hand how many people in my entire life I've had falling outs with. I'm, I'm just, I, I never see any, like, it's all good. It's all good. And, and I know how to like forgive, move on all the time. So, but this, and I forgave this woman. This woman called me up before Yom Kippur and she told me, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. And I said, forgiven. But then when I was coming to Atlanta, I felt a little sick. So clearly there was still something in the air that needed to be fixed. But, okay, so I'm like, I'm gonna, you know, I'll do my due diligence. I'll reach out to her, I'll tell her I'm in town because we're supposed to be friends. But I'm thinking to myself, I'm not, I, I really don't wanna see her. Like I have one day here, I'm focusing on my wedding. I'm here for this wedding. So I texted her and I just said, I'm in town for the day, but I'm not going to have any time to see you. I did my due diligence done, right? The wedding happens, beautiful wedding ends. I, the, one of the Atlanta ladies at the wedding takes me to my host family. It's midnight. We have, the, we have the details, the address to where I'm staying, but it's really late at night. There's a side entrance and I show up and it's locked. There's a combination code. So we're like, oh, okay, no problem. We'll text her. We're not going to call her because she's little kids. We don't want to wake everyone, anyone up. And we're literally at, at this mansion, mansion that they have a whole floor just for Hachnasat or theme, which is like, you know, welcoming guests. Like anyone, like everyone, it's like a train station at the house. They have many guest rooms. You just put in the code, go in and sleep there. It's, it's the bed was ready. Everything was ready. And I was exhausted. This is like two days after Morocco. So I was jet lagged. It's midnight. I just wanted a bed. And um, we're stuck. I'm stuck outside the door. I'm like, Hashem, like I need a bed. My flight is early tomorrow morning. And I thought to myself, I'm just going to go to a hotel. Like, I know, I, what am I going to do? I just need like a shower and a bed and get to my flight tomorrow morning. And then I have this idea. Oh, no, not even idea. Hashem put this in front of me because literally my phone went ding. What time is this? This is midnight. This is midnight. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to go to a hotel. Like, what am I going to do at this hour? And we didn't want to call. We didn't want to knock. So my phone goes ding because the lady, the, the one that I texted, I'm in town, but I'm not going to see you. She responded at that moment at midnight to my message. <laughs> and she said, oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, I didn't get to see you do you have a place to stay? Oh, Come over and stay at my house. So at that point, my, the, the person who was driving me already like had a hotel, like the nearest oh, hotel, no. but you know, we were like on the way basically. And I said, you know what, do you mind taking me to so-and-so's house? I'll just stay there. So I, I, brave of you. so brave. I don't know. So brave, but I just knew, and I came there very exhausted, but I knew that we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit. And then, I, and, and then the next morning I woke up early, we had coffee together and she drove me to the train station to get to the airport. And, and by the time I got out of the car, it was probably like, I would say like two hours that we had spent together. Like we were like hugging and, and, and like, like healed, like healed. Like I actually feel something healed. 
And I didn't realize that that's what I had to do in Atlanta. Like I thought I was going in for the wedding, but there was definitely another deeper layer of the experience mm -hmm. because what I didn't realize when she was awful to me a few years ago was that her whole life was crumbling. And, but being in her house and really having like a late night, you know, pajama party with her, she, you know, she shared a lot. Her marriage fell apart and, you know, her whole world was turned over and she was not in a good place. So, but I wasn't able to see it or understand it. I was just stuck in my hurt and I couldn't fully, fully forgive until I was on her turf. So that was, that was truly a gift. But this line, I loved it. Often the day of apology is not the day of forgiveness. She apologized to me for two young kippers and I said, forgiven. But it wasn't until we had this experience that God literally, like he did not let me into my place. You know what I mean? Like, like, like it was locked. Like, you know, how, how did that happen? Like, right? How did she not text the code? But God had a different plan and we needed to do this deeper healing. So I really love this. And so, so as, as this woman, what, what's her name, Lori? Lori. Lori. So Lori said for, uh, forgiveness or really non-judgment is the gift you give yourself. But, but more than that, forgiveness is, so often forgiveness happens at a later stage, but here's, I wanna take it to, a, to one more level and then we'll end. Sometimes the greatest apology you will get in life is the one that you will never receive. Oh, right. What do you mean? So how is it? Sometimes, so it might not be, it, it's not going to be like, if you're waiting for someone to say the magic words or say, or, or it might, they might, they might say the words that might be lip service. They might be empty words to really, really apologize. You need to be somewhat evolved to humble yourself, to admit and recognize and acknowledge that you were wrong, not everyone could do that. So sometimes that apology that you're waiting for, you'll never actually receive, but we have the ability to still forgive. So you might not ever get that apology. It doesn't mean that we can't move on, okay? So I think I'm gonna end over here. And we'll continue next week with the rest of forgiveness. And okay, I did a little bit of it. Um, and then the next chapter is acceptance. So it'll be a nice bridge into chapter three. If anybody wanted to get a copy of it, because I go through so little of the book in class, it's called Soul Construction. Um, highly recommended. It. It's like an easy read. I read it in one day. And um, I don't know. There's eight chapters. We basically in this Tuesday learning, because there's some newcomers over here. Um, we we go through lots of different, we've already been through like probably four books. We just keep like doing different books. And basically all the all the topics that have to do with the Tuesday learning from 11 to like 12 um have to do with the mitzvot, the, the, the commandments, the obligations that have to do between man and his fellow man meaning like interpersonal relationships, okay? So the class is called Between Me and You. It's all about the mitzvot bein adam lechavero, between, between us and our fellow, okay? And that's what we try to do here. Another, another um, what, what keeps coming in are the, the wisdom, the teachings of Musar, which is rebuke, which is kind of like how to improve yourself. It's a little bit like sometimes the teachings could be a little harsh, but we try to gift wrap them and you know make it a little softer for all of us to like chew on. Um, and that's what we do here on Tuesday. So we're going to, we'll go through all of these eight chapters and then we'll, we'll choose the next work to do. Even, I know. Okay. Um, we need to see you guys. Julie, do you forgive me? Yeah. Julie? <laughs> Julie, are you still talking to me? <laughs> but, okay. but you're not mad at me, right? <laughs> but I, 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 I owned it. I owned it. I'm like, she's so nervous. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, I said whatever. Like I'm thinking about not what my text team was, and I'm thinking about everything she's saying. But it really, but it really, but you want to know.